Uh, our next speaker is Nevin Rosasen uh, with Alberta Agriculture. He's a research economist. He's a farm boy from eastern Saskatchewan. He goes home and helps with the farm. Um, he's a well-educated guy. He's held positions with the United Nations, uh, the Canadian Wheat Board, which we won't hold against him. <laughs> Sorry. Comments are my own, not farming smarters. <laughs> and uh, his, yeah, he's currently uh, conducting economic market and statistical research related to the competitiveness of Alberta agriculture. So without further ado, is, oh, there you are. Sorry, I didn't see you. You're sneaky. <laughs> Here's an Evan. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, first off, thanks to Farming Smarter for uh, offering an invitation for me to speak. Um, I uh, never like to pass up the opportunity to get out and uh, rub shoulders and share conversations with producers, and it's uh, probably the favorite part of, or the part of my job that I look forward to most. Uh, it gets me out of my cubicle farm and lets me actually talk to the, some of the people that are putting all of this theoretical stuff uh, uh, to practice. So with that, I want to thank uh, Farming Smarter and Killer Ken Coles for having me out. So um, I wanted to start off before I get into my topic uh, and talk about these unmanned aerial vehicles and drones. Uh, on our farm, we bought one this uh, August. and. Uh, you know, it was, wasn't too hard to justify a $300 purchase, although my uh, mother, who, you know, is still very much integrated in a, and a key personnel in the operation, had a few questions in regards to this uh, new toy we had, right? But of course, we put that drone to use. Uh, we've used ours for scouting uh, for insects, birth armyworms, uh, even for wheat midge. Uh, for those of you uh, who are going to be here, uh, you'll hear uh, Scott speaking about wheat midge uh, here coming up. Uh, it's kind of a, an insect we've had trouble with in the past. So uh, these unmanned aerial drones are pretty interesting stuff and uh, you can imagine how much time we've already saved for scouting our fields. If you do a proper scout uh, uh, for Bertha armyworms, you know how tough it is to, to trod through uh, the canola and do a, an actual scouting uh, you know, path that you're supposed to complete to have an efficient and uh, accurate count on armyworms. So, We've used it for scouting uh, in the hot part of the day, flying across. We've also used it for aerial photos. My dad even uses it to look inside the top of the bin so he doesn't have to climb the ladder. He just flies it up there. So <clears throat> for those of you who haven't bought a drone yet, 300 bucks, it's a drop in the bucket compared to your costs. And I would say buy one. Uh, better to buy it and ask forgiveness later from the Federal uh, Aviation Authority, whoever's going to bring in the rulings of whether or not they're legal. But uh, I'd say go out and grab one as soon as you can. So my title was Farm Specific Economic Thresholds for Pest Managements. And uh, you know, I had a few people ask me, well, what, what does that mean, farm specific economic threshold? And basically it comes down to the question, to spray or not to spray? Do you keep the sprayer in the shed or do you pull it out? So I'll give you a little bit more background on our operation. We farm about 2,000 acres now. And uh, we had to make the decision whether or not we were going to buy a high clearance uh, field sprayer. And you know, my brother, who is kind of the main operator on the farm now, uh, was quick to say, yeah, we need one. We need a high profile sprayer, the best John Deere you can buy. And uh, we're, I'm going to go start pricing them out. And you know, I had kind of left the farm, or at least the, as the principal operator in 2008 when I went back to get my master's degree. And until then, I'd been pulling an old uh, you know, Borgo 500 gallon tank around and I was dragging tires in the, the field because we couldn't even afford uh, foaming markers, right? We were living off depreciation in my unpaid labor throughout the 2000s. So you can imagine when I leave the farm and we start buying all of this equipment, new combine, a big industrial grain dryer instead of the batch dryer, well, I start to think about the numbers and start to crunch the numbers. And, uh, you know, we decided to buy this uh, new 4730 and uh, then we decided we needed to put it to use. So I'm going to go through a few different things and I know in the summary of the presentation it said I was going to use partial budgets and we'll get to that later because it is an important thing. But first off, what is an economic threshold? So here I downloaded uh, this this morning and I wanted to thank Randall for his uh, <laughs> speech on procrastination because that's kind of the way I fly by the seat of my pants. So I downloaded this uh, picture this morning and it's got all your economic thresholds right there. 
So you can look at whether it's in wheat and you're looking at cutworms here in the south or for canola birth armyworms, I'm going to be using that quite often in this presentation. Or if you're looking at flea beetles, right? When should you spray? To spray or not to spray? Well, there you go. You got it. There's your economic thresholds and I'm done, right? You can get them off the internet and if you're a producer or an agronomist, you can give recommendations and make the decision. However, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper because if you look here, it's probably hard to see, but in the canola section, it says for birth army worms, usually 20 to 30 larvae per square meter, but ranges from 10 to 35 larvae depending on the price of canola. That's a huge factor, right? If you're looking at 2003 prices when it was under five bucks a bushel, that's the prices I remember, right? You didn't spray. But when you're looking at a futures price in August, uh, you know, off of ice at uh, 12 50 13 bucks, well, that really weighs into your decision making, right? So, you know, often you'll see these matrix, that, and I think I've got one coming up, but uh, here's a picture of that sprayer we bought and uh, had to show it because, you know, we're, we're using it now. But, uh, you know, if you got birth army worms, what does my dad say? Well, he says, go nuke those suckers. Get out there. Get her done. You know, they're eating the canola as fast as we can see it. And I'm sure a lot of you who have grown canola uh, know what a birth army worm looks like because as soon as you see them, if it's your crop, your heart skips a beat because they can do some serious damage. But how much damage do they actually do? So this is where we rely on all of our entomologists and our scientists to go out and to accurately build these coefficients of how much one of these suckers can eat, right? So here we have economic thresholds and uh, you got the cost of spraying, dollars per acre, simple enough on the left hand access. Expected seed value in dollar per bushel across the top, so if it's uh, six bucks or 16 bucks a bushel. And you just figure out how many larvae there are. You know, you grab a square meter, throw a hoop out, or shake all the crop and get out and dig under each leaf on the ground to see if you can find those hidden armyworms. Count them up, do four counts per field, and make the decision. However, as my father says, well, what about the big ones? There's some big worms and some little worms. Do they eat more than the little ones, right? And are the birthas hungrier when it's hot out? And how about these things, this Banches flavensens, Athrisia cinerea, what are these things? Actually, these happen to be wasps that uh, eat birth armyworms. So, you know, when I found that out, my dad says, well, let, what insects eat birth is, let's order some up, you know, let's get them out there in the field, release them, you know, let them take care of it. So, these are some of the other things I want to talk about in partial budgets, is these potential beneficial insects. How can we enumerate, and as an economist, how do I put a number or a coefficient on how many births this thing's going to eat, right? So, you know, it's something to think about. So I'm going to jump over to Fusarium head blight. And uh, this is a disease that we've been fighting in eastern Saskatchewan, right? It's been blowing in from Manitoba, or maybe not, maybe just spreading. But, uh, you know, we like to blame it on somebody else. And, you know, as a Saskatchewan boy, we have a going joke, you know, why is Saskatchewan the best, or why is it so windy in Saskatchewan? Well, because Alberta blows and Manitoba sucks, right, based on the wind, but no. So, bad joke, it doesn't go over well in Alberta. So, Fusarium head blight, what is this disease and who knows about it? Well, for us, it's been a real struggle when you, you're pulling off a number one CWRS, 14% protein wheat crop, and then you find out that your falling number is down and it's going to grade a feed, right? So this is a huge issue and it's coming and it's here already in Alberta. So you're going to be out there scouting for Fusarium head blight. And I've got some text up here in regards to how to scout. Basically what it comes down to is if you've got Fusarium head blight in your area, you know, I've been told you got to spray, right? And uh, you know, we never had it and then after two years of getting downgraded on our quality, uh, we decided well we better start to spray. First year we might as well have just catapulted the chemical into the field because we sprayed at the wrong time, wasted a whole bunch of money. Second year we were a little bit closer and finally this past year it was night and day. We finally hit the right timing and we sprayed it in that small window of opportunity. And you know we're only 2,000 acres so we only sprayed 1,000 acres roughly of uh, wheat for fusarium head blight this year. 
but uh, our fields compared to our neighbor's fields across the road were night and day. So you can see some of the spikelet discoloration here in the photos. But like my dad said, we can't see them. This isn't like Bertha's. Should we nuke them anyway? So he's got his Shakespeare hat on going to spray or not to spray. That's the question, right? So what it all comes down to in regards to fungicides, and especially in the case of Fusarium head blight, is the timing, right? I guess here you have kind of a depiction of uh, what, which product to use, the timing, and to spray or not to spray. So this is your increasing impact and your application considerations. I really like this slide. But in regards to timing, this is everything when it comes to fusarium head blight. And uh, you know, we've been told it's maybe a 24 hour window or a 72 hour window. I don't know what it is. And, and I don't have the expertise to tell you, but in our case, we think it's a 48 hour window of when, when you can get this uh, chemical on and for it to be effective. So huge, huge decision making thing here. I'm gonna jump over to wild oats here and this is where I'm gonna get to you to uh, participate, but first, for those of you who haven't done this trick with wild oats, it's my favorite thing to do whenever I have city slickers out to the farm or when my nieces come to visit, is I pull out you know, 50 wild oats from the sample. I put them on the ground and I either find some water or, or <laughs> relieve myself on them, so to speak, and I watch these things twist. Now they have what's called uh, paleo, I believe it's paleo dorsal on or a twisted dorsal on, and it's basically uh, allows the wild oat, as it gets wet, it actually rolls itself along the, the ground and it'll bury itself into a crack. And it's really fantastic. But it's also one of the worst weeds in all of Western Canada and in fact, probably around the world. So my question to you is, when do you spray uh, here in the crowd? Who sprayed for wild oats? How do you make that decision? Is it uh, plants per square meter? How many plants per square meter or per square foot? Anybody? Nuke them. <laughs> Absolutely, just get rid of them, right? You know, and this is a question, I, I went online and I spent, you know, probably three hours trying to look up who has the best economic thresholds for wild oats. And you know what, it's, it's still out there, it depends, right? How much does it cost you to spray, right? And is it gonna be effective? And how much of your yield is it actually gonna, gonna affect? And now, when do you choose not to spray, right? Or why do you not spray? So if it's only three per square meter wild oats, are you gonna spray? Well, it can be costly, right? Especially if you're uh, spraying it, uh, you know, and not sure about the timing or what have you. So when do you decide not to spray? Anybody out there, you know? I don't know. So I was hoping for more participation, gonna see if we could reach a consensus as a group of when to spray, but there is no consensus, right? It all depends. My sprayer cost is much higher with a new $160,000 used, because we never buy new equipment, because my father's also an economist. But, um, you know, we, we have a different cost structure on our farm than you do on yours, right? Everybody's different. So I went in and one of the things I found was this chart, really busy, I don't want you to read anything, and I've circled something here, but variable weed control costs, and this is out of Pakistan's Ministry of Agriculture. And in here they have labor for spraying, two men per hectare, and labor for two hoeings. Uh, I'm not sure who's doing the hoeing, but as you can see, this becomes a little more complicated than that first economic threshold you looked at because they've, they're looking at things like labor costs and other things. In that cost per spraying, dollars per acre, whether it's seven or $27 per acre, how do you factor in your own labor, all of those that are hired, and other things? But I especially like this one because you know labor for two people hoeing uh, for, in, I believe which crop this was, I can't remember. But nonetheless, it, it's just to highlight that, uh, you know, they're doing some good work. So partial budgets, what are they? Well, all a partial budget is, is basically a cost-benefit analysis, right? It examines advantages, disadvantages within a farm operation. So you just lay out all your costs, and I'm gonna go through a partial budget, just ramble it out there that we did on our farm in a minute here. But uh, what are they, right? And what should you include in the partial budget? Right? And how do you put a value on beneficials? Right? Fungi, bees, and my favorite, dragonflies. So 
Here we have a picture of a honeybee pollinating canola. And research in Quebec showed an improvement in seed yield of 46% in the presence of three honeybee hives per hectare. 46% yield. Who would go for a 46% yield increase uh, in their canola? I definitely would like that. And you know, when we're looking through the seed guide and we're, we're making the decision now here soon in which canola seed to order, when you see a two to three to four percent yield advantage of one variety over the other, you're sold, right? So how many of us are going to be putting bees out next year? And I especially like this paragraph that said research from Australia, they found that the pod loss of 15.3 pods per plant over a distance of 1,000 meters from an apiary. This was equivalent to a 16% loss. I like how they phrase it, because they phrase it as a loss, not an advantage of having bees. And when I was over in Australia in 1998, I was touring some canola fields, and at that time, there was bee boxes everywhere. And my father and I asked, well, what are you doing with the bees here? And they said, well, you know, is, is the price of honey that great? And they said, no, we have to have bees in our canola or else our yield losses are so much higher. And it was, it was fascinating. So anyways, I have here Rosassen Farms partial budget, Corrigin versus Desis. But I'm going to go through that at the end because I might run out of time. So bees, how do you put a budget on bees? What about some of the other beneficials? I love these photos when you have uh, fungi attacking uh, grasshoppers. Here you can see these fruiting bodies growing right out of the head of these grasshoppers. I just love those pictures, right? This one too, you know, this guy came to an end and death by fungi, right? What a great way to go out. So what about dragonflies? Did you know that they can eat the equivalent of their body weight in 30 minutes? That's huge. That would be like us eating 100 pounds of food or I guess I'd eat 160 pounds of food and 170 pounds of food in 30 minutes, that's incredible. But these guys are voracious hunters and they can do huge, huge amounts of beneficial work in your fields, whether they're eating uh, wheat midge or other insects. The other thing is they actually eat honeybees too, so you know, where's the balance there? Who's eating who? Anyways, really fascinating stuff and here's another shot of a, a dragonfly eating an insect. So. These are some of the things you've got to think about. So here are a few things I've put up there in regards to what you should probably consider uh, including in your partial budget. So first are your variable costs. And usually this is the only thing that is represented on that left-hand side of the column for your economic thresholds, your cost of spraying, right? This includes your fuel, your time, and your chemical. Easy enough, right? What about the labor? What about your water hauler? or uh, somebody else that's involved in that day of spraying. What about your sprayer operator if you're hiring someone to do that, right? Now you have fixed costs too that you have to include in this budget when you're trying to figure out how much it costs you on your specific farm to spray. So your fixed costs are the cost of that sprayer, uh, the chem handler, the water truck, the water tank, all your pumps, your hoses, all the other additional stuff that you need to include, water softeners if that's the case, uh, other things like this. And I want to bring up this idea of fixed costs versus sunk costs. Your sunk costs are all these variable costs that you've already paid for and put into the ground. So the classic example is fertilizer. You put that down either in the fall or the spring and it's sunk. It's gone. There's no way to recoup that, right? Whereas a fixed cost, let's say like a sprayer, we bought this $160,000 sprayer, if uh, commodity prices really went south and we had a blowout this year, we could have turned around and, sunk and sold the sprayer, maybe for 120,000 bucks, right? So it's not necessarily a sunk cost, it's fixed. But that fertilizer, the chemical, the herbicide you've sprayed on that crop uh, are all sunk costs. So that's maybe something to consider too, is how much you have invested into this crop already. What are the sunk costs? Because at one point, you're not going to be evaluating whether or not you're going to be saving enough yield, right? Or, you know, if, if you've got so many birth armyworms and they're going to chew this much, well, the cost, you know, you have this threshold, I'm going to spray because the cost of spraying, right, those variable costs is going to outweigh or just, you know, the damage that the insect or the pest inflicts. So these are some things you got to think about. And what about payments? Well, payments on that sprayer aren't going away. So, you know, when we budget, we thought, well, we've got about 2,000 acres. On average, we'll do three passes with our sprayer on every acre a year. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, 
In wheat, it could be more. In canola, it could be more as well. If you're spraying twice for herbicide, you're doing a pre-burn off. Maybe you're doing a post-harvest burn down, or maybe you're even doing a desiccation in wheat or, or other crops. So this is something to consider. But remember, these payments don't go away. So an idle sprayer isn't making money either, right? So the other thing is, what if you decide to just let them eat? Canola now hits um, a low, let's say canola drops down to six bucks a bushel, and uh, you just say, well, I'm just gonna let them eat. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, what are your neighbors gonna say, right? If everyone sprayed for uh, grasshoppers and you're the only one who didn't? Well, they're pretty mobile, they can move around. Uh, same with wheat midge. What if there's huge infestations of wheat midge in your area and you're the only one who decides not to spray and all your neighbors spray and the wheat midge ends up eating their crops too. So, and the other thing is crop insurance and I'll touch on this later because that's something to consider as well. Um, environmental factors. These are hugely important, right? If you're looking at birth armyworms uh, and you've got five days of wet, cool weather, uh, high of 12 or 13 degrees Celsius and rainy and high humidity, you know, maybe you can tolerate 15 birth armyworms per square meter. Maybe they're not going to do enough damage. But if you've got a forecast of 25 degrees Celsius as the high and nice and sunny all week, you can be guaranteed that those birth armyworms are going to eat a lot more. Same when it comes to your fungicides, right? If you have cool, damp uh, weather and a really thick canopy, well, uh, and a forecast for maybe more rainfall or high humidity, so probably a pretty good chance you're going to pull the trigger and spray. But if it's hot and dry and windy, and uh, you know, pretty unlikely that you're going to make the decision. So environmental factors are very important, and they need to be considered in your partial budget. The other one I don't have on here is timeliness of operation, and I'm going to cover that in my partial budget. So what about your crop insurance? What if you decide not to spray, and you're five-year or ten-year average, however it is that AFSC calculates your, your, your uh, insurable coverage level, what does that happen if you decide, you know, I've got a 35 bushel or I've got a 35 or 40, whatever it is, we'll say 35 bushel an acre yield history for canola. What happens if you decide not to spray and your yield drops down that year to 25? How does that affect your average and how does it affect your yield history moving forward? So this is something you might want to consider too. Um, also your premiums, will they go up? Do they go down? I can't uh, speak intelligently on that matter. It's, it's, it's up to you to figure that out. And what about weed banks if you decide not to go out and nuke the wild oats, right? If you've only got, you know, three or four per square meter, um, you decide not to spray them out, how does that impact your operation, right? So we know that wild oats can survive for, what, 12, 14 years uh, in the seed bank without germinating. Uh, so it's something to consider. So I'm going to go through a quick partial budget that we did on our farm. And then I'm going to open it up to questions and maybe discussion. Um, you're welcome to try pick my brain, although I've told you everything I know and it didn't take me long. So. I'm going to go through the choice that we made this year. We are looking at spraying for birth armyworms this year, and we did spray. But we decided to do a partial budget. The thing is, my brother, who's on the farm operating now, doesn't like to spray insecticides, right? Nobody likes to spray them. They are a little toxic, uh, obviously, more so than herbicides. And, uh, you know, my brother said, well, I don't want to spray Desis, I don't want to spray Seven, I don't want to spray Matador, I'm not spraying insecticides. And we said, well, we've got a pressurized cab there, Nelly, and, uh, you know, you got to make the choice. And that idle sprayer isn't making money, so what are we going to do? And then we found out there is this new chemical on the market called Corrigin, and it's supposed to be a bee-friendly, a pollinator-friendly chemical, and it uh, is like an eco-brand or bait where you spray it on the crop, and once the insect ingests the crop, then they succumb to the poison and they die, right? However, it is supposed to be a lot friendlier on bees. So we said, hmm, we should check this out. It was 15 bucks an acre compared to uh, some of the other insecticides that run about $5 an acre. So we decided to do the partial budget and say, well, let's see how much it'll cost us to spray. So we started running it through. And uh, so it was, we spray Corrigin with our own sprayer, or we hire the spray planes to come in and blanket 
800 acres around our community with uh, desis or seven or whatever chemical you, you want to choose. And they run about five bucks an acre. So starting off the hop, 15 versus five bucks, well, you know, it's pretty clear that we're going to go for the five dollar one. But then to hire the spray planes was seven dollars and fifty cents an acre, right? And uh, we started thinking, hmm, that's a little bit. And uh, oh, we have to run the five dollar chemical all the way to Yorkton, which is, uh, you know, a two and a half, three hour round trip. Uh, pick it up, drive it there, and that's some something to consider. Or you could just buy it straight from them, and they'll charge you six fifty. So now the cost is six fifty versus fifteen bucks. And then we started going through. Well, if we spray this corrigin, how do we put a number on the beneficials, right? So a, we're going to keep those bees around. Uh, most of the canola had already been potted up, but some of it was still flowering. And what about the dragonflies? And if we're to spray and kill all of the dragonflies and all the honeybees, how do we put a number on that? And we said, well, you know, the dragonflies, they're probably not going to eat birth armyworms, right? But they might eat wheat midge in the field next door. And we had a lot of wheat fields surrounding our canola fields. So we said, well, let's just assume a 50% probability that if we spray with matador or one of the generic insecticides, that we're going to kill all the, all the dragonflies, and they're not going to fly across the road to eat the wheat midge. So we're going to say that we have to now spray 50% of our acres for wheat midge. And we built that into the budget. And some people will say, well, you can't do that. The dragonflies aren't going to fly across the road and eat the wheat midge. And I said, well, you show me the data that says they won't, right? <laughs> so we built this into our budget. And then on our own side for cost of spraying, we had Corrigin at 15 bucks an acre. We had to incorporate our fuel costs, which, you know, 122 gallon tank on this tractor and you can spray a thousand acres in a day and don't need to fuel so pretty efficient but we had our fuel costs but we also had to add two percent tramping right on a hundred foot booms so we assumed that you'd have uh, two feet of tire tracks for that hundred feet so two percent and uh, then you have to multiply that by your potential yield in canola, which we said would conservative estimate 40 bushels an acre. And we did hit just over that this year, so we we're quite happy. But, uh, and then multiply it by the price at 12 bucks a bushel. So all of a sudden, when you're spraying it yourself, you're, you have to factor in an extra 10 bucks an acre for tramping versus the spray planes that just come and get her done. So we went through this whole budget. And we figured it out that with assuming the 50% probability that you have to spray all of your wheat acres, right, uh, with a chemical again, if, if you kill those dragonflies, we found out that on 800 acres, we were only $5,500 ahead by choosing the spray planes. But the thing that really made us uh, make the decision to spray it ourselves with Corrigin was the fact that the spray planes were going to be three or four days. They couldn't guarantee when they're going to show up. So that timeliness of operation, we also had to factor into our budget, right? So what we did do is we hired the spray planes. We told them, yeah, you can spray 800 acres if you get here tomorrow. But if you don't make it within four days, you won't have anything left to spray. Well, they ended up coming and spraying all of our neighbors' fields anyways and blanketing the community with desis. But uh, they did get uh, 100 of our acres, but we got all the rest with Corrigin. And we were very happy with the chemical, by the way. I think I get a, a bonus here from many of the chemical reps that are selling that today. But it turned out to be a pretty good operation. And the last thing we had to consider in our budget was the value, and this is the choice that my brother had made, that he's not going to spray insecticides. But how do you put a value on your health, right? I know that when I was uh, running and doing most of the spraying operations, I had a, an accident where I mixed two chemicals that I shouldn't, and I ended up uh, passing out for about three hours on the front lawn and had a headache for a good two or three weeks, right? And uh, so, you know, I joked with my brother and I said, well, you know, we should just uh, have you spray the desis and then we're further ahead, right? And he says, well, I don't want to spray that stuff, you know? I don't have kids yet. You've got one boy. I don't have any, right? So how do you put a value on your, your little brother's unborn children? You know, that's a tough one to incorporate into your partial budget. It's one I've been struggling with, and he's been struggling with even more. So you can see where I'm going with this in regards to not necessarily just trusting the agronomist when they say, hey, here's your, here's your square. This is your cost. If it's 10 bucks an acre, and you got 22 larvae per square meter at 9 buck canola, you go out and spray. 
And if you have one larvae left, don't do it. The economic thresholds cannot be defined that sharply. And a lot of the time it comes down to your expert opinion and judgment on your own farm, on your own fields, and in regards to your own climatic conditions. And it is kind of a gut shot, a gut feeling in regards to what you're going to do. So I want to thank you for your time uh, in order to present here, but I do want to open it up for uh, questions, comments, discussion, or even uh, a potential number you want to throw out there on my brother's unborn children. I don't know, whatever you think. So uh, does anyone ever go through the whole exercise of these partial budgets? Do you know what your exact cost is to spray per acre? Because ours worked out to be about fourteen fifty an acre uh, with a $5 chemical when you factor in all of these different things, including the $22 an hour we have to pay the labor that we have sitting idle uh, at the water truck, just being there hauling the odd load of water. So it, it can be quite costly. And one other thing I want to say is you, you can't necessarily manage what you don't measure. And if you don't know what your costs are to spray per acre, you better pencil it out and figure it out. And it is a bit of a tedious exercise, and everybody's cost is going to be different. So with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions that you might have or any discussion. There's a question. Did you factor in your depreciation on the equipment for the extra hours? The question is, did you factor in your depreciation on the equipment for the extra hours? And uh, yes, in our budget, we had a $160,000 sprayer, uh, 4730. It was about three or four years old when we purchased it. And uh, we, we looked at it for the lifetime of the sprayer. We figured we could get 10 years out of it. And at that time, we would sell it for maybe 30,000 bucks. So it works out to be $130,000 over 10 years. And if you spread that out over 6,000 acres, or sorry, 2,000 times three, yeah, 6,000 acres, it comes out to just a bit over, what was it, a uh, um, buck 65, a buck 80 an acre is what it cost us. And that, I'll remind you, is, is also a fixed cost. And whether or not you spray or you don't spray, right, you're still making payments on that sprayer. So good question, depreciation should always be factored in to your partial budgets. And it doesn't have to be perfect, you don't have to use any fancy formulas, just add it in there. Any other questions? All right, well thanks a lot for your attention and uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present here today. Oh, right on. That was excellent. Thanks. Good job, man.